Chapter 10 of The Old, Old Fairy Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Old, Old Fairy Tales by Laura Valentine. The Story of Prince Tito. There was once upon a time a king named Gange, who was a great miser. When he wished to marry, he sought for a wife, not a good or clever woman, but a princess who had a great deal of money and liked to save it. He succeeded in finding this treasure, a miserly and wealthy wife. They had two sons. The elder was called Tito, the younger Mirtillo. Tito was a charming child, pretty and engaging, but the king and queen took a strong dislike to him when they saw him sharing his toys with other little children. Mirtillo would rather let his bonbons spoil than give them away. He put away his playthings for fear of spoiling them by playing with them, and when he held anything in his hand, he clasped it so closely that even in sleep it could not be taken from him his parents consequently adored this little reflection of themselves the princes grew up and for fear tito should spend his money the king gave him none one day as tito was hunting one of his attendants riding swiftly up to him knocked down an old woman who fell into the mud and cried out loudly that her leg was broken but the young squire who had caused the accident only laughed. Tito indignantly reproached his attendant for being so unfeeling, sprang off his horse, and went with his favorite page, Iveyi, to the aid of the unfortunate woman. They raised her, and, taking each an arm, led her back to her little cottage, which was near the spot. The prince was in despair at having no money to give the poor creature to atone for the injury done her. Of what use is it to be a prince when one has not the power of doing good, he said bitterly. My prince, replied Iveille, I have a crown which is at your disposal. Thank you, Iveille. I will borrow it and pay you when I am king, said Tito. I accept your crown for this poor woman. When Tito returned to the court, the queen, who had heard of the accident, reproved him for debasing himself by giving personal help to a beggar. Madam, replied Tito, I think a prince is never greater than when he is doing good. You are a simpleton for thinking so, exclaimed his mother. The next day, under pretense of hunting, Tito rode to the cottage to ask how the old woman was. He found her well, and she thanked him for the charity he had bestowed on her. "'I have a favor to ask of you, my prince,' she added. "'I have some nuts and medlars which are very good. I beg you to eat some of them.' The prince did not like to refuse, lest the old dame should think that he despised her humble offering. He tasted the nuts and medlars and found them excellent. "'Since you like them,' said the dame, do me the honor of taking the remainder for your dessert. At that moment, a hen clucked. The woman ran into the yard and brought in a new-laid egg, which she begged the prince also to accept. He received her gifts very kindly, fearing lest he should hurt her feelings if he refused, and gave her in return four guineas that Iveille had brought him from his father, who was a rich country gentleman, the prince, on his return home, ordered them to give him the egg and nuts for his supper. But, on breaking the egg, he was astonished to find in it a large diamond. The walnuts and medlars were also full of diamonds. The attendants were very much astonished, and some of them ran at once and told the queen of this singular discovery. She hastened at once to her son's room and was so charmed at seeing the diamonds that she kissed tito and called him her dear son for the first time in her life 
will you give me these diamonds she asked all that i have is at your service my mother replied the generous son you are a good boy exclaimed the queen i shall reward you for your kindness she went off with the diamonds and soon after sent the prince four guineas neatly folded in a piece of paper the prince's attendants exclaimed loudly that they wondered the queen was not ashamed to send only four guineas in return for a gift of the value of five hundred thousand pounds but the prince checked them with a frown and ordered them to leave the room for their want of respect to their sovereign the queen meanwhile said to ganguet it is plain that the old woman tito helped is a powerful fairy we must go and see her to-morrow and we will take mirtillo with us for i don't wish her to make a favorite of this stupid boy who throws away diamonds so she ordered the carriages to be cleaned and that some horses should be hired for they kept none of their own to save expense they filled one of the two carriages with physicians surgeons and apothecaries and the royal family went in the other when they had entered the old woman's cabin the queen told her that she had called to apologize for the thoughtlessness of her son's squire my son she added has not the sense to choose good attendants but i shall order him to discharge that brutal young man then she told the old woman that she had brought the cleverest doctors in the kingdom to cure her injured foot the old woman answered that her foot was quite well and that she was much obliged to her majesty for her kindness in coming to see her a poor old woman oh said the queen but we know that you are a great fairy for you have given prince tito a quantity of diamonds i assure you madam replied the woman that i only gave the prince an egg and some walnuts and medlars i have a few more at the service of your majesty if you will deign to accept them i accept them gratefully said the queen who was charmed at the hope of getting more diamonds she received the nuts and embraced the old woman and the courtiers following her example paid great court to the peasant the queen asked her age i am sixty she answered you don't look forty said the queen you ought to think of marrying for you are really very amiable prince mirtillo who was very badly brought up burst into a loud laugh when he heard his mother speak thus and said that he hoped he should have the pleasure of dancing at her wedding but the good woman did not seem to perceive that he was making fun of her then the royal visitors took leave of her and drove home the queen instantly sent the egg to be cooked broke the walnuts and opened the medlars but instead of finding diamonds she found a little chick in the egg and the walnuts and medlars were full of worms the queen flew into a great passion that old woman is a witch she cried who has ridiculed and mocked me i will have her put to death she assembled the judges to try the old woman but eville who had heard it all hurried to the cabin to save the poor peasant good morning page of old women she said laughing for thus the courtiers had named him since he had pulled her out of the mud ah my good mother said eville hasten to seek safety in my father's house he is an excellent man he will hide you willingly but if you remain here you will be seized and put to death i am much obliged to you for your kindness said the old woman but i do not fear the wicked queen and she suddenly changed from an old woman to a beautiful fairy eville was dazzled by her loveliness and would have thrown himself at her feet but she prevented him i forbid you she said to tell the prince or any one else what you have seen but i wish to recompense your charity ask me therefore for a gift madam said the page i dearly love my master prince tito to serve him i will ask of you a great gift 
enable me to become invisible so that i may know who are his true friends among the courtiers and protect him from their plots for he has cruel enemies i grant you this gift said the fairy but now i must pay tito's debts did he not borrow four guineas from your father he has returned them madam he thinks that it is shameful for princes not to pay their debts he returned the four guineas the moment the queen sent them to him i know that said the fairy but the prince is unhappy because he could not acknowledge the loan by a gift and it is that debt which i wish to pay take this purse which is full of gold carry it to your father and tell him he will always find the same sum in it provided that he only takes money from it to do good actions the fairy then disappeared and eville carried the purse to his father and besought him to keep it secret the judges called by the queen to try the old woman were meantime greatly embarrassed and said to her for what can we try this poor woman she has not deceived your majesty she told you that she was poor and had no diamonds the queen was furiously angry and said if you will not condemn this wretch who has mocked me and put me to the expense of hiring horses and paying doctors you shall repent it the judges thought to themselves the queen is a very wicked woman if we disobey her she will find means to kill us it is better that an old woman should perish than that we should so they condemned the old woman to be burned alive as a witch there was one judge however who would not agree to this verdict he said that he would rather be burned alive himself than condemn an innocent person a few days afterward the queen found false witnesses who declared that this good judge had spoken against her his office was taken from him and he his wife and children were reduced to beggary but eville took a large sum from the fairy purse and giving it to the judge advised him to go and live happily in another country and he took the advice and went to england where he lived very happily meantime eville made himself very often invisible he could do so by a wish and heard many secrets and much that amused him but he was too honorable ever to repeat anything he thus overheard he was often invisible in the king's cabinet and one day he heard the queen say to her husband are we not unfortunate in having tito for our eldest son we are amassing great treasure which he will spend when he becomes king now mirtillo would save and increase it is there no way to disinherit tito and make mirtillo king we must see about it said the king and if we can't prevent tito's having the crown we will bury the treasure so that he shan't spend it eville heard the courtiers constantly speaking evil of tito and praising mirtillo in order to please the queen then they would go to tito and tell him how they had taken his part to the king but tito to whom eville told the truth only laughed at and despised them there were however four great noblemen at the court who were men of honor these always took tito's part but never told him they had on the contrary they advised him to love his parents and be very obedient to the king about this time a neighboring king sent ambassadors to ganguet on an affair of importance the queen according to her custom did not mean that tito should appear before these strangers she sent him to a beautiful country house belonging to the king because she told him the ambassadors might wish to see it and he must do the honors of it to them then she prepared for the interview she had an old velvet petticoat of her own made up for the backs of the robes of ganguet and mirtillo the fronts were made of new velvet 
for the queen thought that as the king and prince were seated no one would see the backs of their dresses to make them magnificent she used the diamonds found in the meddlers as buttons for the king's robe she looped up his cap with the large diamond out of the egg the diamonds taken from the walnuts were employed as buttons on Mertillo's collar and sleeves. The king and prince were quite dazzling in the light of the diamonds. Ganguet and his wife sat on their throne, and Mertillo at their feet. But the ambassadors had hardly entered the room before the large diamond changed to an egg, and the others to walnuts and meddlers. The ambassadors thinking that ganguet and his queen had dressed themselves so ridiculously as an insult to their master left the presence in great anger saying that their sovereign would soon teach king ganguet that he was not a king of walnuts it was in vain that the ministers tried to explain matters to them they would not listen and returned to their own country Ganguet and his wife were very much ashamed and very angry. It is Tito who has played us this trick, said the queen. We must disinherit him and leave the crown to Mirtillo. I willingly consent to do so, replied the king. The next moment they heard a voice say, If you are wicked enough to do it, I will break all your bones the king and queen looked at each other with surprise they could see no one yet some one spoke close by it was evie who was watching over the safety of his master meantime when king violent had heard from his ambassadors that ganguet had turned him into fun and insulted them he declared war against the miser king Ganguet was dreadfully frightened, for he was a great coward. But the queen said, Don't distress yourself. We will make Tito commander-in-chief. He is rash and brave. He will get killed, and we can then leave the crown to Mirtillo. The king thought this a capital plan. He appointed Tito general of all his forces, and gave him full power to make war or peace. Tito, having arrived on the frontiers of the kingdom, resolved to await the enemy there, and employed his troops meanwhile in building a strong fortress in a narrow pass by which alone the country could be entered. One day, as he watched the soldiers at work, he became thirsty, and, seeing a house on a mountain opposite, he climbed up it to ask for some water. The master of the house, who was named Abor, gave him some as the prince was coming down the mountain he saw a very pretty peasant girl sitting down by a trickling brook she had an expression of great innocence and sweetness in her dark eyes and a very modest manner when he spoke to her she told him that her name was bibby and that she was abor's daughter the prince chatted a long time with her and after that day called frequently at abor's house for he was never so happy as when talking to Bibby. She had been well educated, and talked well of books which the prince loved, and he found all her sentiments and opinions good. She appeared also to be a very obedient and loving daughter. So at last Prince Tito said to himself, If I were my own master, I would marry Bibby. She is not born a princess, but she has so many virtues that she is worthy to become a queen. Every day he loved Bibby better, and one day he wrote a letter to her to tell her so. But Bibby, who knew that she ought not to have letters of which her father did not know, took it at once to Abor. When he had read it, he told his daughter that she could not marry a prince, and Bibby said that she knew it, and that she would be glad to go away and visit her aunt, who lived at some distance, for she loved the prince and did not wish to make him do wrong. Abor sent her away the next morning. Prince Tito was very sorry when he found that she was gone. He told Abor that if Bibi would wait, he would marry her and make her queen when he was king, and that he would not ask to see her 
till he was crowned. At that moment, the fairy in all her beauty appeared in the room. The prince was very much surprised, for he had seen her only as an old woman. Prince, she said, I am the old dame you so kindly helped. You are an honorable and excellent young man, and Bibby is as good a girl. You shall marry her in two years, but during that time you will have trouble. I promise you that I will pay you a visit the first day of every month, and I will bring Bibby with me. The prince was delighted with this promise, and determined to gain a great deal of glory to please Bibby. King Violent soon afterward offered him battle, and a hard fight ensued. Tito showed great gallantry. He won the day, and took Violent prisoner. His officers advised Tito to seize Violent's kingdom at once, but Tito said, I will not. His subjects, who love him, would be unhappy under a foreign yoke, and there would be no peace in the kingdom. There would be continual war. No, I will give Violent his liberty, and let him return to his people. He is generous. He will become our friend, and his friendship will be worth more to us than his kingdom. Tito was right. Violent, set free without paying a ransom, was charmed with Tito's generosity, and swore eternal friendship to his conqueror. Tito returned victorious to his home, but was received by his father with violent reproaches. The king had expected that Violent would have been made to pay a large sum of money, and was furious with his son for not making him pay it. Tito, who loved and respected his father, was so grieved at his displeasure that he became ill. One day, as he was alone in bed, forgetful that it was the first day in the month, he saw two pretty canaries fly in at the window, and was much surprised when suddenly they changed into the fairy and his dear Bibby. He was just thanking the fairy for her visit when they heard steps approaching, and both became again canaries. Immediately afterward, the queen entered, followed by some of her attendants, and carrying a great cat in her arms, a pet of hers, because it cost nothing to keep, and preserved the food from mice. As soon as the queen saw the canaries, she exclaimed that they ought not to be left loose, they would spoil the furniture. The prince said he was going to put them in a cage. She replied that she meant to have them taken at once, as she intended to eat them at dinner. The prince, in despair, besought her to spare them to him. In vain! The courtiers and servants hastened to take the canaries. A valet knocked poor Bibby down with a broom. The prince sprang from his couch to save her, but it seemed that he would be too late, for the great cat, escaping from the queen's arms, was about to kill the canary by a blow of her paw, when the fairy, taking the form of a large dog, sprang on her back and strangled her. Then, taking herself and giving Bibby the shape of a little mouse, they ran into a small hole in the skirting board and disappeared. The prince had fainted in his agony lest Bibby should be killed, but the queen took no notice of him. She only loudly lamented the fate of her cat. She hurried back to the king and told him that she would kill herself if he did not revenge the death of her pet, that Tito was the friend of sorcerers, and that she should have no rest unless he was disinherited and the throne given to Mirtillo. The king consented, and told her that he would arrest the prince the next day and have him tried for witchcraft. The faithful Iveyi had made himself invisible and followed the queen. He now hastened to warn the prince. The fright he had suffered had quite cured his fever, and Tito was about to mount his horse and escape when the fairy again stood before him. I am tired, she said of the wickedness of your mother and the weakness of your father. I have at your disposal a large army. Go and take the king and queen in their palace and put them in prison with Mirtillo. Then you will at once ascend the throne and marry Bibby. 
madam replied the prince you know that i love bibby more than my life but even the hope of marrying her cannot make me forget the duty i owe to my parents i would rather die than turn my arms against them let me embrace you said the fairy i did but make trial of your goodness if you had accepted my offer i would have given you up but now i am ever your friend and will give you proof of it take the form of an old man and in this shape travel through your father's dominions and see for yourself how many injustices are committed on your poor subjects so that you may do them justice when you become king Eveille shall remain at court to give you warning of all that happens in your absence the prince obeyed the fairy and in his wanderings saw things that made him shudder justice was sold the governors cruelly oppressed the people the nobles robbed the peasants and all was done in the name of the king at the end of two years Eveille wrote to tell him that his father was dead and that the queen had tried to have his brother crowned but that the four faithful nobles had opposed it knowing from Eveille that tito lived and the queen defeated had fled with her son into a province that she had persuaded to revolt from its allegiance tito retook his own shape and returned to his capital at once where he was gladly received and acknowledged as king then he wrote respectfully to his mother offering to her and his brother a good income if she would not encourage the revolt the queen who had assembled a great army answered that she would take nothing less than the crown which she would tear from his head but shortly afterward she heard that king violent had espoused the cause of his friend tito and was advancing against her with a large army undeterred by any of the considerations that stayed tito's hand in despair she then wrote to her son accepting his offer of an income thus tito remained peaceful possessor of the throne shortly afterward he married bibby to the satisfaction of his subjects who knew her goodness and strewed their path with flowers pleased that he had taken a peasant bride there were no such king and queen before or after in that land as tito and his queen who taught by adversity in their youth could feel for all and were ever ready to help and console those who needed help or consolation tito as soon as he had ascended the throne began to reform abuses and re-establish order in his dominions to achieve this result he gave directions that any who had to complain of injustice were to come before him and state their wrongs and that not even beggars were to be refused admission to his presence for said this good prince i am the father of all my subjects poor as well as rich at first the courtiers were not much concerned at hearing this discourse the king they said is young this whim will not last he will soon tire pleasure will engross him and he will leave the management of his affairs to his favorites but they deceived themselves tito by careful management of his time could do his duty perfectly and yet find leisure to partake of innocent pleasure while the punishments inflicted at first on wrongdoers prevented any repetition of such offences he sent ambassadors to king violent to thank him for his ready friendship and that king returned answer that he should be delighted to see tito again and that if he tito would go to the borders of his kingdom violent would meet him there as all was tranquil throughout his dominions tito willingly consented for the project was favorable to one he had previously formed that was to embellish the small dwelling in which he had seen his beloved bibby for the first time with this intention he ordered his officers to buy all the land surrounding it but they were not to compel anyone to sell his property for everyone tito said 
ought to be master of even the smallest heritage violent arrived on the frontier and the two courts were united and became very brilliant violent had brought his only daughter with him elise so she was named was as beautiful as bibby and almost as good tito had brought with him not only his wife but also one of his cousins named blanche who was not only fair and gentle but also very witty as they were ruralizing the two kings declared that they would cast aside the etiquette of courts and live on equal terms with their subjects that the nobles and ladies should sup with the two kings and the princesses and that no one should address the kings as your majesty if they did so they were to forfeit a guinea it was their first supper in the country and they had not been seated at table above a quarter of an hour when a very shabby little old woman appeared in the room tito and Evie, who at once recognized her rose to greet her but by a warning glance she told them that she wished to remain unknown they therefore simply presented her to violent as one of their best friends who had come to ask them for some supper and violent bowed courteously the old dame without ceremony however at once placed herself in an armchair close to violence which no one had dared to take before from respect to the king as she seated herself she said to the prince as our friends friends are our friends i am sure you will wish me to be at my ease with you violent who was by nature very haughty was embarrassed by the familiarity of the old woman but he concealed his annoyance they had told the old lady of the fine for styling the kings your majesty but she was hardly seated before she said to violent your majesty appears surprised at the liberty i take but it is my habit and i am too old to be cured of it now therefore your majesty will pardon me a forfeit cried violent you owe two guineas do not distress yourself your majesty said the old woman i had forgotten that we must not say your majesty but your majesty forgets that in forbidding people to say your majesty you impose another kind of restraint on them they must always be thinking of how to avoid using the common form of respect however i now owe you six guineas and here they are and she took out a worn old purse and threw six guineas on the table violent began to get angry but out of consideration for tito he restrained himself and said playfully well my good mother do as you please whether you address me as majesty or not i am not less your friend i quite believe you said the old woman that is why i took the liberty of speaking my mind to you i shall do so whenever there is occasion for one cannot do a greater service to one's friends than to tell them when they are in error but you must not rely on my patience replied violent there are times when i do not choose to receive correction acknowledge my prince said the old woman that you are not far off one of those times at present and that you would give anything to get rid of me such are our heroes they would scorn to show a lack of courage in face of the enemy or to yield a battle without a brave struggle but they own calmly that they cannot control their anger as if it were not more shameful to yield to a passion than to an enemy whom it is sometimes impossible to overcome but let us change the conversation since it is not agreeable to you and allow my pages to enter they have some gifts to bestow on the company at the same instant the old woman struck the table and there entered by the four open windows four beautiful winged infants each of them carried a basket full of jewels of astonishing richness the king at the same moment casting his eyes on the old woman was surprised to see that she had changed into a lovely lady so richly dressed that she dazzled the eyes ah madam he exclaimed 
i recognize you now as the fairy whose medlars and nuts cost a war pardon the little respect i have shown you for i had not the honor of knowing who it was that sat beside me that should show you said the fairy that you are bound to be courteous and attentive to all guests at your own table but my prince to show you that i am not offended i wish to make you two presents the first is this goblet it is made of a single diamond but it is not that alone which renders it precious every time that you are tempted to fly in a passion fill this goblet with water and drink it three times and you will find your anger give way to reason if you profit by this gift you will have rendered yourself worthy of the second i know that you love the princess blanche she likes you but fears your temper and will only marry you if you will promise to use this goblet violent surprised that the fairy should know his faults and inclinations so thoroughly acknowledged that he loved blanche but he added there is an obstacle which opposes our union even if i could obtain blanche's consent to it it will always be a pain to me to marry for fear of depriving my daughter of a crown that is a generous feeling said the fairy there are few fathers to be found capable of sacrificing their inclinations to the happiness of their children but that need not prevent your marriage the king of mogolan who was one of my friends has just died childless and by my advice he has left his kingdom to Evie. Evie is not a prince by birth, but he deserves to become one. He loves the princess Elise, and she is worthy to become the recompense of his fidelity. If her father consents, I feel sure that she will accept him without repugnance. Elise blushed at this speech. It is true that she thought Evie very amiable and that she had listened with pleasure and admiration to the story of his fidelity to his master. Madam, said Violent, we have taken to speaking frankly. I esteem Evie, and if the custom of my country did not tie my hands, I should not require a crown for him to give him my daughter. But men, and above all kings, should be bound by that which is due to their rank and it is not the habit of royal fathers to give their daughters to simple gentlemen i should act contrary to all the traditions of my house if i married mine to one elise is descended from one of the most ancient families in the world you know that for three hundred years we have occupied the throne my prince said the fairy you are ignorant of the fact that the family of Evie is as ancient as your own, for you are relatives and descend from two brothers. In fact, Evie has the precedence, for he descends from the elder brother and your father from the younger. If you can prove that, said King Violent, I swear to give my daughter to Evie, even if the subjects of the late King Mogolan should refuse to recognize him as their sovereign nothing is easier said the fairy than to prove the antiquity of evie's family he is descended from the eldest sons of japhet the son of noah who established himself in the peloponnesus you are descended from the second son of japhet everybody felt inclined to laugh at this mockery but violet flushed with anger and was about to speak when the princess blanche who was at his side presented the diamond goblet to him he drank of it three times as the fairy directed him and during the interval he reflected that it was quite true that all had descended from noah and that the only difference between those descendants proceeded from their characters having emptied his goblet he said to the fairy i thank you madam for having cured me of two great defects my pride of birth and my habit of passionate anger i admire the virtue of the goblet for while i drank 
my anger was calmed and my reflections between the three drafts have completed the task of recalling me to reason i will not deceive you replied the fairy there is no magic in the diamond goblet i will tell you in what the sorcery of the water consists it gives time for reflection and no one who pauses to reflect can become the slave of anger in truth madam said violent i have learned more to-day than in my whole previous life happy tito you will become the greatest king in the world under such a protectress i beseech you to use your influence with this lady to induce her to become my friend have i not given you proofs that i am your friend said the fairy at present let us think only of your marriage and of that of the princess elise at this moment a servant informed tito that the officers he had sent to buy bibby's old home and the adjoining lands wished to speak to him he commanded them to be admitted they entered bringing with them the design of the estate that tito had given them they had added to the cottage a large garden and a great park which would be perfect if they could remove a little house which was exactly in the middle of the finest avenue and completely spoiled the effect of it and why have you not pulled it down asked king violent sire replied the officers our king has forbidden us to do violence to any man and the owner of this small dwelling will not sell it though we have offered for it four times as much as it is worth if that insolent fellow were my subject i would hang him said violent you would first empty your goblet said the fairy i think even the goblet would not save his life replied violent is it not horrible that a king should not be master of his own estates and that he should be obliged to abandon a work he desires to finish through the obstinacy of a man who ought to be too happy to make his fortune by obliging his master but i shall not abandon my design said tito laughing i shall make that house the chief ornament of my park oh how can you asked violent placed as it is it will spoil the park this is what i shall do replied tito i shall build round the house a wall sufficiently high to prevent this man from entering my park but not so high as to shut out his view for it would not be just to shut him up in a prison this wall will continue on both sides and there will be read on it these words in letters of gold a king who built this wall prefers leaving it and the cot it encloses to spoil his park rather than commit an injustice on one of his subjects by taking from him by force the heritage of his fathers everything i hear amazes me said violent i confess i had very little idea of the virtues which form heroic men yes tito that wall will be the ornament of your park and your good action will be the ornament of your life but madam to the fairy how is it that tito possesses naturally such great virtues great king said the fairy tito was brought up by parents who detested him he was subject to perpetual contradiction he had to submit and give up his own will to that of others even in things indifferent and as during the late king's life he had neither wealth nor influence courtiers and flatterers did not deign to spoil him they would have gained nothing by it they gave him up to the honest people who loved him for himself alone and from them he learned that a king is free to do good but should have his hands tied when he would do harm you who became king at twelve years old never underwent this discipline or any other your guardians only looked to your future favor and never corrected your faults they called your pride proper dignity your violence vivacity and thus they spoiled you 
violent convinced of the truth of what the fairy told him and instructed by her in his duties endeavoured to fulfil them and to conquer his faults he was encouraged in his efforts by his wife blanche by Evie, who became his son-in-law and by tito who preserved on the throne the virtues he had learned in the days of adversity end of section ten recording by linda johnson chapter eleven prince fatal and prince fortune this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org this recording by emily lost the old fairy tales by laura valentine prince fatal and prince fortune there was a queen who had two sweet pretty little boys and a fairy who was the queen's intimate friend was invited to stand godmother to them and make them some gift i endow the eldest she said with all manner of misfortunes till he is twenty-five and i name him fatal at these words the queen gave a loud cry and entreated the fairy to change her gift you do not know what you ask she said to the queen if he does not meet with misfortunes he will be wicked the queen dare say no more but begged the fairy to let her choose for a second son perhaps you will choose wrong replied the fairy but no matter i am willing to grant whatever you ask me for him i wish said the queen that he may succeed in whatever he undertakes tis the way for him to be perfect perhaps you may be mistaken said the fairy and for that reason i grant him this gift no longer than till he is twenty-five nurses were provided for the two young princes but the very third day the nurse of the eldest prince was taken ill of a fever he had another and she fell down and broke his leg a third became ill and it being spread abroad that prince fatal was unfortunate to his nurses nobody would nurse him or so much as come near him the poor child was hungry and cried but met with no pity at last a mean homely countrywoman who was very poor and had a large family of children which she could scarcely maintain came and offered to bring him up provided they would give her a large sum of money and as the king and queen did not love prince fatal they gave her what she asked and bade her take him home to her village the youngest prince who was named fortune on the contrary throve surprisingly his father and mother doted upon him and never thought of the eldest the wicked woman to whom they had given poor fatal no sooner reached home than she took off his fine swelling clothes to bestow them on a son of her own about fatal's age and having wrapped the poor prince in an old petticoat she carried him into a wood and left him to be devoured by the wild beasts but the lioness that her three young whelps brought him into her den and gave him suck which made him grow so fast and strong that at six months he could run alone in the meantime the nurse's son whom she passed for the prince died and the king and queen were glad they got rid of him fatal remained in the woods till he was two years old when a nobleman an officer of the court as he was hunting was astonished to find a lovely boy amidst the wild beasts he was moved to pity took him home and hearing that the child was wanted as a companion to play with prince fortune he presented fatal to the queen fortune had a master to teach him to read but this master was charged above all things not to make him cry the young prince heard this and cried every time he took his book in hand so that at five years of age he could hardly tell his letters while fatal on the contrary read perfectly well and he had already made some progress in writing to frighten the prince his master was ordered to whip fatal whenever fortune neglected his lessons so that it was in vain for fatal to be good and apply himself to his book he could not escape punishment besides fortune was so ill-natured and wilful that he used his brother very ill though indeed he did not know he was his brother if fatal had an apple or plaything fortune would snatch it away he obliged him to be silent when he wanted to speak and would make him talk when he wished to hold his tongue in a word fatal was a little martyr and pitied by no one and the prince and his small courtiers ridiculed him for his love of study they lived together in this manner till the eleventh year when the queen was amazed at her son's ignorance certainly she said the fairy has deceived me i imagined my son would the most learned that ever was since i wish him to succeed in whatever he undertook 
accordingly she went to consult the fairy about the matter who said to her madame you should have desired a willing mind and virtuous inclinations for your son rather than great talents all his endeavours are to be wicked and your majesty is a witness of the great progress he has made after having said this she turned from her and the poor queen returned to her place in the utmost affliction she hastened to reprove fortune in order to make him better but instead of promising amendments he told her that if they vexed him he would starve himself the queen at this frightened out of her senses took him upon her knee kissed him gave him sweetmeats and assured him that he should not learn anything for a whole week if he would eat his dinner as usual all this time fatal improved so much that he was quite a wonder of learning and mildness of temper he had been so used to being contradicted that in a manner he had no will of his own and he thought himself happy if he could but prevent the ill effects of fortune's capricious humour but this sad child enraged to see that fatal improved more than himself could not bear the sight of him and the tutors to please their young master beat poor fatal every moment at last this wicked boy told the queen that he would not have fatal live with him any longer and that he would not eat a morsel till he was sent away so that poor fatal was turned into the street no one daring to take him in fear of displeasing the prince he passed the night under a tree half dead with cold as it was winter with only a morsel of bread for his supper which some good person or other had given him out of charity as soon as it was daylight he said to himself i will not stay here doing nothing but try if i could not get my living till i am big enough to be a soldier i remember to have read in history of several private soldiers who had afterwards been made great generals and perhaps if i behave well i may have the same good fortune tis true i have neither father nor mother but god himself is the father of orphans and he that gave me a lioness for my nurse will surely not forsake me now having said this fatal kneeled down to say his prayers for he never missed saying them night or morning and always when he prayed he fixed his eyes on the ground with his hands lifted up and joined together and neither turned his head this way nor the other while fatal was on his knees a countryman chanced to be going by and seeing him pray so earnestly he said to himself i am sure this must be a good child i have a great mind to have him to take care of my sheep and god will bless me for his sake so he waited till fatal had ended his prayer and then said to him little boy will you come and live with me and mind my sheep i will keep you and take care of you with all my heart said fatal and i will do all in my power to serve you honestly this countryman was a wealthy farmer and had a great many servants who wronged their master and indeed so did his wife and children they were mightily pleased when they saw fatal for they said this is but a child and we can do whatever we will with him but fatal kept the sheep faithfully and proved a good little shepherd one day the farmer's wife said to him child my husband is a miser and never gives me any money let me take a sheep and you shall tell him the wolf ran away with it madam replied fatal i would with all my heart do anything to serve you but i'd rather die than be a thief and a liar you are a fool she said who will know it oh madam fatal answered god will know it for he sees whatever we do and punishes those that lie and steal at these words his mistress lost all patience she flew upon him beat him tore the hair off his head the farmer hearing fatal cry came and asked his wife what made her beat him in that manner why truly said she because he is a glutton the little greedy fellow has this morning eaten up a pot of cream which i was going to carry to the market oh fie said the farmer i cannot bear greedy people and immediately he called one of his servants and ordered him to whip fatal and all that poor boy could say to justify himself signified nothing his mistress insisted that she saw him eat the cream and she was believed after this he was sent into the fields to tend the sheep again and his mistress went to him and said well will you give me one of the sheep now no indeed replied fatal i should be very sorry to do any such thing you may use me as you please but you shall never make me guilty of an untruth so finding him resolute this wicked woman out of revenge set all the other servants against him they made him stay out late in the fields and instead of giving him food like the rest she only sent him bread and water and when he came home laid to his charge all the mischief that was done in the family he stayed a year at the farmer's and though he lay on the ground and was but very indifferently fed yet he grew so strong and tall that at thirteen years of age any one would have supposed him to be fifteen besides he was so patient that he bore all their ill usage 
with the utmost calmness and meekness one day while he avast at the farmer he heard that the king of a neighboring country was at war and wanted soldiers fatal went and asked his master to let him go and having got leave he travelled on foot to this prince's territories where he enlisted himself under a captain who though he was a great nobleman behaved more like a porter or a dry man than a person of quality he swore beat his soldiers and cheated them of their pay and with this officer fatal was more miserable than at the farmer's he had engaged for ten years and though he saw the greatest number of his comrades desert yet he would never follow their example for he said i have received money to serve ten years and it would be wronging the king to go away before my time is expired notwithstanding this the captain who was a bad man used fatal no better than the rest yet he could not help esteeming him because he saw that he always did his duty and would send him on his message and entrust him with money and give him the key to his room whenever he dined abroad or went into the country and though he did not love reading he had a large library to make people believe he was a man of sense and learning for in that country they despised an ignorant officer and looked upon such as did not know something of books or at least of history as unfit for the military station of importance when fatal had done his duty as an officer instead of going to gamble and drink with his comrades he would lock himself up in the captain's room and there endeavoured to learn his professions by reading the lives of great men till at last he became capable of commanding an army he had been seven years enlisted when his regiment was ordered to the field his captain took him and six others and went to reconnoitre a wood and they were in the midst of it the soldiers said to one another let us kill this wicked fellow who is always caning us and cheating us of our pay fatal represented the baseness of such an action and dissuaded them from it but instead of heartening to him they said they would kill him and the captain too and immediately drew their swords fatal placed himself before the captain and fought with so much bravery that he alone slew four of the soldiers his captain seeing he owed his life to fatal asked his pardon for all the wrong he had done to him and having informed the king of what had happened fatal was made a captain and the king gave him a considerable pension now none of the soldiers ever wanted to kill fatal he loved them as if they were his children and they had the same affection for him as for a father instead of defrauding them of their pay he gave them money out of his own pocket to encourage them when they behaved well was careful and tender of them when they were sick or wounded and never found fault with them out of caprice or ill humour about that time a great battle was fought and the commander-in-chief being slain all the officers and soldiers fled but fatal cried out that he had rather die fighting than to flee meanly like a coward and his soldiers told him they would not forsake him and their example had so great an effect with the others that they all came back ranged themselves round fatal and fought with such success that the son of the king of the enemies was taken prisoner the other king was greatly rejoiced when he heard that he gained the victory and told fatal that he made him general of all his armies afterward he presented him to the queen and to the princess his daughter who gave him their hands to kiss but at sight of the princess fatal was struck motionless like a statue she was so beautiful that he fell in love with her to destruction and then he was unhappy indeed for he thought that such a one as he could have no hope of marrying a great princess he resolved for that reason to conceal his affection and daily underwent the utmost torture but it was much worse when he was informed that fortune was also in love with the princess gracia having seen her picture and that of an ambassador had arrived to ask her in marriage fatal was ready to die with grief but the princess gracia who knew the fortune was a base and wicked prince and treated her father with such eagerness not to force her to the match as the ambassador was told that the princess did not choose to marry yet fortune who had never been used to be contradicted fell into a most violent passion when they returned with the princess's answer and his father who could not deny him anything declared war against the father of gracia but he was not much concerned about it for he said while fatal is at the head of my army i am not at all afraid of being overcome so having sent for his general he told him the affair and bid him prepare for war fatal at this threw himself at his feet and said that he was born in the dominions of prince fortune's father and could not take up arms against his sovereign but the king was very angry and threatened to put him to death if he refused to obey him and on the contrary promised to give him his daughter in marriage if he defeated fortune this was a sad temptation to poor fatal however at last he resolved it to be his duty and therefore without saying anything to the king he quitted the court 
and forsook all his riches and great expectations fortune soon after put himself at the head of the army and took the field but before five days were at an end he fell ill with fatigue for he was very delicate and tender and having never been used to any hardships or to take any exercise he could not bear heat and cold in short everything made him ill about this time the ambassador who had been sent to demand gracia for fortune in order to make his court to the prince told him that he had seen the little boy who had been turned out of the palace at the court of gracia's father and that it was generally reported that he had promised him his daughter in marriage fortune at this piece of intelligence fell into the most terrible fits of passion and as soon as he was recovered he sent out fully resolved to dethrone the father of gracia and he promised a great reward for whoever shall take fatal either dead or alive fortune gained several great victories though he did not fight himself for he was afraid of being killed but he had able and experienced commanders at last he besieged the capital of the enemy and was preparing to take it by storm when on the eve of his intended assault fatal was brought before him for great numbers of people had been sent in search of him bound in heavy chains fortune rejoiced at this opportunity of exercising his revenge and gave orders for him to be beheaded before they stormed the town in sight of the enemy that very day he gave a grand entertainment to his officers to celebrate his birthday the twenty-five years being now complete the besieged hearing fatal was taken and was to have his head struck off in an hour resolved to deliver him or perish for they remembered how kind he had been to them while he was their general they asked the king's leave to sally out and were victorious fortune's gift of prosperity was now over and in his flight from the enemy he was killed the conquerors ran to unbind fatal and at the same moment they saw two glittering chariots appear in the air from one of which a fairy descended in the other were fatal's father and mother who were both fast asleep they did not awake till just as the chariots touched the ground the fairy however advanced fatal was unbound and addressing the queen and presenting fatal to her she said madam in this hero behold your eldest son the misfortunes he has undergone have corrected the defects of his temper which was naturally violent and unruly whereas fortune who on the contrary was born with excellent inclinations had been utterly spoilt by indulgence and flattery and god would not permit him to live any longer because he would only have grown more wicked every day he lived he is just now killed but to comfort you for his death know that impatient of ascending the throne he was on the point of dethroning his father the king and queen were greatly astonished and embraced fatal very affectionately having heard great commendations of him princess gracia and her father were delighted with the discovery of prince fatal's rank he married gracia and they lived to a good old age perfectly happy and perfectly virtuous end of chapter eleven Chapter Twelve of the Old Old Fairy Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Cheryl Holmes, M.D. The Old Old Fairy Tales by Laura Valentine. Chapter Twelve: The Beneficent Frog there was once upon a time a king who sustained for many years a constant war against his neighbors after many battles his capital was besieged he was frightened on account of his queen and entreated her to retire to a castle that he had fortified and which he had never visited but once the queen employed prayers and tears to persuade him to allow her to remain with him she wished to share his fate and uttered piercing cries when he gently forced her into her chariot to hasten her departure however he ordered his guards to accompany her and promised to absent himself secretly as often as he could to visit her he soothed her with this promise though it was scarcely probable that he would be able to fulfil it for the castle was situated at an immense distance from the capital in the middle of a thick forest and without being acquainted with the roads it was impossible to discover it the queen set out very sorrowful at leaving her husband amid the perils of war she was conducted by short stages lest the fatigue of so long a journey should make her ill 
at last she arrived at her castle very uneasy and very low-spirited after a short repose she wished to amuse herself by walking about the environs of the castle but she found nothing to make her cheerful she looked all around her but could see nothing save immense deserts which rather increased than diminished her grief she looked toward them sorrowfully and sometimes said what a difference between my present abode and the one that i have always hitherto been used to if i remain here much longer i shall die to whom shall i speak in this solitude with whom can i share my grief and what have i done to deserve banishment from the king it seems that he wishes me to feel all the bitterness of his absence by exiling me to this disagreeable castle in this way she would complain and although the king wrote to her every day and sent her very good news about the siege she became more and more afflicted and determined to return to her husband but as the officers who were with her had been ordered not to conduct her back except a courier were sent expressly for her she kept her resolution secret and had a little chariot made in which there was only room for herself saying that she intended occasionally to go hunting she herself guided the horses and followed so closely on the dogs heels that the huntsmen could not keep up with her by this means she made herself mistress of her chariot and consequently had it in her power to go when she liked there was but one difficulty which was that she did not know the roads of the forest but she flattered herself that the gods would conduct her safe through and after having made a few small sacrifices she said that she intended to have a grand chase and wished everybody to be there that she should go in her chariot and that everybody should take different roads so as to leave no retreat for the wild beasts this was done the young queen who thought soon to see her husband had dressed herself to a great advantage her hat was covered with feathers of various colors her vest enriched with precious stones and her beauty which was by no means of a common kind thus set off made her look like a second diana while the company were all occupied with the pleasures of the chase she slackened her horses reins and encouraged them with her voice and two or three lashes with the whip after going along at a good round pace they began to gallop and then ran away their chariot seemed to be borne along by the winds and could hardly be followed with the eye poor queen now that it was unavailing repented her temerity what have i undertaken she said how was it possible for me to guide horses so high-spirited and unmanageable alas what will become of me ah if the king thought that i was in such danger as this what would become of him he who loves me so tenderly and who only sent me away from his capital city to place me in greatest safety behold how i have repaid his tender care of me the air resounded with her grievous lamentations she called on the gods she invoked the fairies to her assistance but the gods and the fairies had abandoned her the chariot overturned she had not strength to jump quickly on the ground and her foot became jammed between the wheel and the axle tree it may be easily imagined that it was only by a miracle that she escaped with her life from so shocking an accident she lay stretched on the ground at the foot of a tree she had neither pulse nor voice and her face was covered in blood she had been a good while in that dreadful condition when opening her eyes she perceived near her a woman of gigantic size clothed only in a lion's skin her arms and legs being naked her hair was confined with a dry serpent skin the head of the serpent hanging over her shoulders she had a club made of stone in her hand which served for a walking stick to support her and a quiver full of arrows by her side such an extraordinary figure made the queen think that she was dead for she could not imagine that after such dreadful accidents it was possible for her to be still alive and speaking in a very low tone i am not surprised she said that so much grief is felt at resolving to die for what one sees in the other world is very terrible the giantess who overheard her could not help laughing at the queen's idea that she was dead cheer up she said to her i know that you are among the living or your destiny will not be the less sorrowful i am the fairy lioness and my residence is not far from here you must come and pass your life with me the queen looked at her sorrowfully and said 
if it please you mistress lioness to conduct me back to my castle and inform the king what you will accept for my ransom he loves me so dearly that he will not refuse even half his kingdom no answered the giantess i am rich enough i have been very dull for some time past at being alone you have wit perhaps you may be able to divert me as she said these words she took the form of a lioness and placing the queen on her back she carried her to the bottom of her terrible cave when she arrived there she healed the queen's wounds by means of a liquor with which she rubbed her how surprised and how grieved was the queen when she found herself in that dreadful abode it was gained by ten thousand stairs which led to the centre of the earth where was a large lake of quicksilver covered with monsters whose various figures might have frightened one less timid than our queen a few dry roots and horse chestnuts were all that the fairy lioness ever gave the persons who were so unfortunate as to fall into her hands when it was almost time for the queen to go to bed the fairy told her that she might make herself a cabin for that she was going to remain with her all her life the princess at these words could not restrain her tears oh what have i done she said to deserve being detained here if my death which i feel approaching will give you pleasure put me to death at once it is all that i dare hope from your pity but do not condemn me to a long and miserable existence without my husband the lioness laughed at her grief and told her that she advised her to dry her tears and try to please her that if she did not do so she would be the most wretched person in the world what must i do then said the queen to move your heart i am fond said the fairy to her of fly pies i wish you to find means of catching enough flies to make me a very large and excellent pie but answered the queen i do not see any at all here and if there were plenty it is not light enough to catch them and if i had caught them i never made any pastry so that you have given me a task which i cannot fulfil no matter said the unmerciful lioness i will have what i wish the queen made no reply she thought that in spite of the cruel fairy she had but one life to lose and in the state she then was what had she to fear instead then of looking for flies she seated herself under a yew tree to weep at her ease she might thus have wept for a long time if she had not heard over her head the sorrowful croaking of a crow she looked up and by the assistance of the little moonlight that lighted the bank she saw a large crow holding in its bill a frog which apparently she was about to crunch although nothing happened to save me said the queen i will not neglect to save the life of a poor frog which is as much afflicted in its way as i am in mine she made use of the first stick that she laid her hand upon to make the crow let go its hold the frog fell lay for some time insensible and after a while recovering its frogly spirits beautiful queen it said you are the only kind person whom i've seen in this place since curiosity first brought me here by what miracle are you able to speak little frog answered the queen and who are the people whom you see here for i have seen no one yet all the monsters with which this lake is covered replied quenuieta that was the frog's name have once been in the world some kings and others in the confidence of their sovereigns their fate sends them here a while although none of those who come here ever return any better or are corrected for their stay i can easily understand said the queen that the union of many wicked persons will not aid in the reformation but with regard to you mistress frog what are you doing here curiosity has induced me to come here replied she i am a half fairy my power is limited in some things and very extensive in others if the fairy lioness knew that i were in her dominions she would put me to death but how is it possible said the queen that fairy or half fairy a crow should have been about to devour you two words will explain that to you said the frog when i wear my little wreath of roses on my head in which consists my chief power i fear nothing but unfortunately i had left it in the marsh when that wicked crow pounced upon me i confess madam that but for you i should now have been dead 
and since I owe you my life, if anything lies in my power to alleviate yours, you may command me in whatever way you please. Alas, my dear frog, said the queen, the wicked fairy who holds me in captivity wants me to make her a fly pie. There are no flies here. If there were any, it is too dark to catch them, and I am in danger of dying under her blows. Leave it to me, said the frog. Before long, I will furnish you with enough. She then rubbed her body all over with sugar. Then she called out of the pond quite an army of frogs, upward of six thousand of her acquaintance, and they did the same. They then went to a place crowded with flies, for the wicked fairy had there about a magazine of them, purposely for tormenting unfortunate persons in her power. When they smelt the sugar, they settled on the bodies of the officious frogs, who then made haste back to where the queen was. Never was there such a capture of flies, nor a better pie than the queen made for the fairy lioness. When it was presented to her, she was not a little surprised, not understanding by what means the queen had managed to catch so many flies. The queen, being exposed to all the inclemency of the air, which is poisonous, caught some cypress branches to begin building her little house with. The frog generously came to proffer her assistance, and putting herself at the head of those who had been to fetch the flies, the whole of them assisted the queen to erect a little building, which, when completed, was the prettiest in the world. But the queen had hardly lain down in it when the monsters of the lake, jealous of her repose, came to torment her with the most deafening and horrible din that until then had ever been heard. She arose, dreadfully terrified, and fled, which was just what the monsters wanted. A dragon, who had formerly tyrannized over one of the finest kingdoms in the world, immediately took possession of her little house. The poor afflicted queen wished to complain of this, but in truth she was only ridiculed. The monsters whooped at her, and the fairy lioness told her that if she kept dinning such lamentations in her ears, she would soundly beat her. So she was obliged to hold her peace and apply it to the frog, who was the most obliging creature in the world. They wept together, for when she had her wreath of roses on, she could laugh and cry the same as an ordinary person. I feel so strong a friendship for you, said the frog to the queen, that I will recommence building your little house though all the monsters of the lake should die with spleen. She immediately set about cutting the wood, and the queen's little rural palace took so short a time to build that she went to bed in it that same night. The frog, attentive to all the queen's wants, had made her a bed a wild time. When the wicked fairy understood that the queen no longer slept upon the ground, she sent for her. Tell me immediately, who are the gods or men who protect you? She said to her. This land always watered with rain of fire and sulphur has never yet produced even the value of a leaf of sage notwithstanding that i learn that odoriferous herbs grow under your footsteps i am ignorant of the cause madame answered the queen the humour takes me said the fairy to have a nosegay of the rarest flowers try if your good fortune will supply you with one if it does not you shall need a good flogging for i often administer floggings and always do so marvellously well the queen began to cry such threats were not agreeable to her and the impossibility of finding flowers made her despair she returned to her little house her friend the frog called to see her how sorrowful you are said she to the queen alas dear gossip this is not enough to make me so the fairy wants a nosegay of the finest flowers and where shall i be able to find them you perceive that there are none here yet her mandate runs that my life depends upon satisfying her wish amiable princess said the frog graciously i must try to free you from your embarrassment there is here a bat who is the only one with whom i have had any dealings she is a good creature and can go faster than i i will lend her my wreath of roses by the assistance of which she will be able to find you some flowers the queen made her a low curtsy for there was no means of embracing quenuyetta quenuyetta immediately went to talk with the bat who some time afterward returned concealing under her wing some very beautiful flowers the queen made haste to take them to the wicked fairy who was more surprised than ever not understanding by what miracle the queen was so befriended upon all occasions the queen was incessantly devising some means of making her escape 
she communicated her wish to the good frog who said to her permit me madame first of all to consult my little wreath and we will then act according to its advice she accordingly took it and having placed it on some straw she burned some slips of juniper wood some capers and two little green peas and croaked five times then the ceremony being finished she resumed her wreath of roses to speak like an oracle fate which orders all things she said forbids your quitting this place you will here have a princess more beautiful than the mother of love for the rest do not trouble yourself as time alone will be able to relieve you the queen cast down her eyes and tears forced their way but she resolved to trust in her friend at least you will not abandon me she said to her the good frog consoled her as well as she was able but it is high time to say a few words concerning the king while his enemies had him besieged in his capital city he could not be continually sending messengers to the queen however having made several sallies and obliged them to retire he felt much less the happiness of this event on his own account than on that of his dear queen whom he could now recall to his court without danger he was ignorant of her disaster none of her officers having dared to go to the city and inform him of it they had found in the forest the remains of her chariot and all the amazonian decorations with which she had adorned herself to go and seek him in the horses having escaped as they had no doubt of her being dead and as they thought she had been devoured they did not debate among themselves about the expediency of persuading the king that she had died suddenly at this fatal news he thought that he himself should die of sorrow hair torn tears shed mournful cries sobs sighs and other sad privileges of widowhood were indulged in after having spent several days in retirement he returned to his capital city dressed in deep mourning which he felt more in his heart than his clothes testified all the ambassadors of the kings his neighbors came to condole with him and after the ceremonials which are inseparable from such an occurrence he applied himself to giving his subjects an interval of quiet exempting them from war and procuring for them an extensive commerce the queen was ignorant of all this and she was happier when heaven blessed her with a little princess as beautiful as quenuietta had foretold she was named Mufet and with much difficulty the queen obtained leave of the fairy lioness to bring her up for she was so ferocious that she had a violent longing to eat her Mufet, the wonder of our time was already six months when looking at her with tenderness mixed with sorrow the queen said incessantly oh if the king your father saw you my poor little baby how glad he would be how dear you would be to him but perhaps at this moment he's beginning to forget me he believes that we are forever buried in the horrors of death perhaps even now the place in his heart devoted formerly to me is occupied by another these sorrowful reflections cost her many tears the frog who loved her sincerely seeing her thus crying said to her one day if you wish it madame i will go and find the king your husband the journey is long and i travel slowly but at last a little sooner or a little later i hope to accomplish it this proposal could not have been more agreeably received than it was the queen clasped her hands and even made mouffette join hers to show madame quenouilleta how obliged she should be if she would undertake the journey she assured her that the king would not be ungrateful but continued she of what utility will it be to him to know that i am in this sorrowful abode it will be impossible for him to rescue me from it madam replied the frog we must for our part do what depends upon us and leave the care of the rest to heaven they then bade each other adieu the queen wrote to the king with her own blood on a little scrap of linen for she had neither ink nor paper she entreated him to trust in all respects to the worthy frog who had brought him news of her she was a year and four days ascending the ten thousand steps that lay between the black plain where she had left the queen to the world and she was another year forming her equipage for she was too proud to be willing to appear at a royal court like a sorry frog from the marsh she had made a little car large enough to conveniently hold two eggs it was entirely covered outside with tortoise shell and lined with the skins of young lizards she had fifty maids of honour who were those little green frogs which leap about the meadows each of them was mounted on a snail on an english saddle with her leg on the bow 
comporting herself to admiration several water rats dressed as pages to whom she had confided the care of her person preceded the snails in a word nothing was ever so pretty especially as her wreath of red roses always fresh and blooming became her the best in the world she was rather vain over her errand which had made her use rouge and patches it was even said that she was painted as are most of the ladies of that country but on inquiry it was found that it was her enemies who had spread that report of her she was seven years on her journey during which time the queen suffered inexpressible pains and hardships and but for the fair mouffette who consoled her she would have died over and over again that wonderful little creature never opened her mouth or spoke a word without delighting her mother she even softened a little the heart of the fairy lioness and at last after the queen had passed six years in that horrible sojourn she allowed her to take her daughter a-hunting provided that all she killed should be for her what a pleasure for the poor queen once more to see the sun she was so unaccustomed to the sight of it that she was fearful of becoming blind with regard to mouffette she was so skilful that though only five or six years old nothing escaped her aim by this means the mother and daughter softened a little the fairy's cruelty Renouillette travelled day and night over hill and dale and at last arrived near the capital city where the king held his court she was surprised at seeing wherever she came nothing but dancing and feasting there was laughing there was singing and the nearer she approached the town the greater she observed was the joy and festivity her majestic equipage surprised everybody all who saw it followed her and the crowd became so numerous when she entered the city that she had the greatest difficulty to reach the palace at that palace everything was magnificent the king who had been nine years a widower had at last yielded to the prayers of his subjects he was on the point of marrying a princess certainly less beautiful than his wife but who nevertheless was very charming having quitted the car the good frog entered the palace followed by all her cortege she had no occasion to demand an audience the monarch his betrothed and all the princes were too impatient to know the object of her coming to interrupt her sir she said i do not know whether the news i bring you will give you joy or sorrow the wedding which is about to take place convinces me of your infidelity to your queen her memory is always dear to me said the king shedding tears which he could not restrain but you must know gentle frog that kings do not always what they wish my subjects have been pressing me to marry for the last nine years i owe them heirs and accordingly have turned my eyes toward this young princess who appears to me to be charming in every respect i do not advise you to marry her for polygamy is a hanging matter your queen is not dead here is a letter written with her blood which she entrusted to me you also have a little princess mouffette who is more beautiful than all the goddesses the king took the rag on which the queen had scrawled a few words he kissed it he watered it with his tears and showed it to all the assembly saying that he knew very well his wife's handwriting he asked the frog a thousand questions which she answered with as much wit as liveliness the bride-elect and the ambassadors charged with seeing the solemnization of her marriage made very wry faces ho oh, sir said the chief of them is it possible that you can on the assertion of such a reptile as this break off so solemn a marriage the scum of the marsh has the insolence to come with a line no mouth to your court and enjoys the pleasure of being listened to mr ambassador said the frog learn that i am not the scum of the marsh and since i must here display my science fairies and frogs appear all the frogs rats snails lizards and herself at their head did appear but no longer in the shape of those dirty little animals their figures were tall and majestic their countenances agreeable their eyes brighter than stars each of them wore a crown of precious stones on his head and a royal mantle on his shoulders made of velvet and lined with ermine with a long train which is borne by male and female dwarves at the same time trumpets kettle drums oboys and drums pierced the clouds with their agreeable and warlike sounds all the fairies and frogs commenced a ballet so lightly danced that at the least gambade they leaped as high as the ceiling of the saloon the attentive king and the bride-elect were equally surprised when they saw these honourable mary andrews all at once metamorphosed into flowers which danced none the less jasmine 
jonquils, violets, pinks, and tuberoses than when they had had legs and feet. It was an animated flower bed, the motions of which were equally grateful to the nose and pleasant to the eye. In a moment, the flowers vanished and were replaced by several fountains. Their waters, rapidly ascending and falling, formed themselves into a large canal, which took its course at the foot of the palace walls. It was covered with little painted and gilded pleasure boats, so pretty and elegant that the princess invited her ambassadors to enter them with her and take a little trip in them. They were very willing, thinking it was all a play which would at last terminate in a happy wedding. Directly they had embarked, the pleasure boats, the river, and all the fountains disappeared. The frogs became frogs again. The king asked for his princess. The frog replied, Sire, you have no right to any princess but the queen, your wife. Were I less her friend, I should not have troubled myself about the marriage which you were on the point of contracting. But she has so much merit, and your daughter Mouffette is so amiable, that you must not lose a moment in trying to deliver them. I must confess to you, Mistress Frog, said the king, that if I had not believed my wife was dead, there is nothing in the world that I would not have done to see her again. As for the marvels that I have performed in your presence, replied she, it appears to me that you ought to be convinced of the truth of my assertions leave your kingdom under strict orders and do not defer your departure here is a ring that will furnish you with the means of seeing the queen and of speaking to the fairy lioness although she is the most terrible creature in the world the king no longer seeing the princess whom he was to have married felt his passion for her growing very weak and on the contrary that which he had entertained for the queen gaining new ground he set out unaccompanied by any one after having made very considerable presents to the frog do not be disheartened said the latter to him you will have formidable difficulties to overcome but i hope you will succeed in attaining your wish the king comforted by these words took no other guide than his ring to seek his dear queen as mouffette increased in size her beauty improved so much that all the monsters of the quicksilver lake fell in love with her the dragons of terrible shape and size humbled themselves at her feet. Although she had constantly seen them, her beautiful eyes could not become accustomed to them. She fled and took refuge in her mother's arms. Shall we be here long? said she to her. Will our misfortunes never cease? The queen gave her good hopes to console her, but in her heart she entertained none herself. The long absence of the frog, her profound silence, so long a period passed without any news from the king all this i say afflicted her excessively and gave her no room to hope the fairy lioness gradually accustomed herself to allow them to go hunting with her she was dainty and fond of the game which they killed for her but the only recompense she gave them was either the feet or the head what was more valuable however was their being permitted to enjoy once more the precious light of day the fairy took the shape of a lioness the queen and her daughter seated themselves on her back and in that way they scoured the woods the king conducted by his ring happening to stop for a short time in a forest saw them pass like an arrow from a bow he was not perceived by them but though he wished to follow them they absolutely vanished from his eyes notwithstanding the incessant misfortunes of the queen her beauty was not changed and she seemed to him more beautiful than ever all his former passion rekindled and not doubting that the young princess with her was his dear mouffette he determined to perish a thousand times rather than abandon his design of rescuing them the officious ring conducted him to the gloomy abode which had been tenanted by the queen for so many years he was not a little surprised at descending to the centre of the earth but what he saw there astonished him still more the fairy lioness who was ignorant of nothing knew the day and hour when he was destined to arrive what would she not have given if fate in conjunction with herself had ordered it otherwise but she resolved at least to oppose all her power to that of the king she built in the middle of the quicksilver lake a crystal palace which floated like a wave she confined the poor queen and her daughter in it and then addressed all the monsters who were amorous of mouffette saying you will lose this beautiful princess if you do not interest yourselves with me to defend her against a knight who is coming to carry her off the monsters promised to neglect nothing that lay in their power they surrounded the crystal palace the lightest of them stationing themselves on the roof and walls others at the doors and the remainder in the lake 
the king by the advice of his faithful ring went first to the fairy's cavern she was waiting for him in the shape of a lioness directly he appeared she sprang upon him he wielded his sword with bravery that she had not expected and as she was raising one of her paws to beat him down he made a cut at one of her joints and exactly hit her knee she uttered a loud cry and fell he went up to her put his knee on her throat and swore that he would kill her and in spite of her invulnerable fury she could not help being afraid what do you wish me to do she said to him what do you require of me i mean to punish you replied he proudly for having carried off my wife and if you do not immediately restore her to me i will strangle you on the spot look toward that lake said she and see whether she is in my power the king looked in the direction she pointed out to him and saw the queen and her daughter in the crystal castle which was floating like a galley without oars or helm on the surface of the quicksilver his joy and grief were so great that they nearly cost him his life he called them at the top of his voice and made himself heard by them but how to reach them was a question while he was seeking the means of doing so the fairy lioness disappeared he kept running round the shores of the lake when he arrived on one side and was very near reaching the transparent palace it went away from him with incredible swiftness and his hopes were thus constantly disappointed the queen who was fearful that he would presently get tired called to him not to let his courage fail that the fairy lioness wished to fatigue him but that true love cannot be daunted by any difficulties thereupon she and Mufette stretched their hands toward him supplicatingly at that sight the king felt himself strengthened yet again and raising his voice he swore by Styx and acheron rather to pass the remainder of his life in that sorrowful place than quit it without them he must have possessed great perseverance for he passed his time very miserably the earth covered with brambles and thorns served him for bed his only food was wild fruit more bitter than gall and he had incessant battles to fight with the monsters of the lake husbands who would endure all this for the sake of seeing their wives once more were certainly contemporary with the fairies and his conduct sufficiently distinguishes the epoch of my tale three years passed away without the king having any grounds for hoping to attain his end he was almost in despair he resolved a hundred times to throw himself in the lake and he would have done so if he could have looked upon such conduct as a remedy for the queen and princess's troubles he was running according to his usual custom first to one side then to another when a frightful dragon called him and said if you are willing to swear to me by your crown and scepter your royal mantle your wife and daughter to give me a certain dainty bit to eat that i am fond of and which i shall ask you for when I feel inclined for it, I will take you on my wings. And in spite of all the monsters which cover the lake and guard the crystal castle, I engage that between us we will liberate the queen and the princess Mufet. Ah, my dear dragon, cried the king i swear to give you and all your dragonish kind whatever you please to eat and will always remain your grateful debtor do not bind yourself replied the dragon if you do not intend to keep your word for in that case such terrible misfortunes will happen that you will remember them all the rest of your the king redoubled his protestations he was dying with impatience to deliver his dear queen he mounted on the dragon's back the same as he would have done on the finest horse in the world the monsters came to meet them and opposed their passage they fought and nothing was heard but the sharp hissing of serpents and nothing seen but sulphur and saltpetre falling indiscriminately at last the king reached the castle the efforts were there renewed 
bats owls and ravens all opposed his entrance but the dragon with his claws teeth and tail crushed to atoms the most daring among them the queen on her side who witnessed that dreadful conflict by dint of kicking with her feet broke pieces from the walls and made of them arms to assist her dear husband they were at last victorious they met and the enchantment was dissolved by a thunderbolt which fell into the lake and dried it up the officious dragon disappeared on the instant with all the other monsters and the king without being able to divine by what means was transported to his capital city he found himself with the queen and mouffette seated in a magnificent saloon at a table spread with a delicious repast never was astonishment equal to theirs or joy greater all the subjects hastened to see their queen and the young princess who as a climax to the prodigy was so superbly dressed that their sight could hardly endure the dazzling lustre of the precious stones it is easy to imagine that the pleasure of all kinds was the chief business of the happy court there were masquerades races for rings tournaments which attracted the greatest princes in the world and mouffette's beautiful eyes detained them all among those who appeared the handsomest and most skilful of them the prince mufi was always bore off the palm nothing was heard but applause everybody admired him and the young mouffette who had till then been always among the dragons and serpents of the lake could not avoid doing justice to mufi's merit he never let a day pass without showing her fresh gallantries for he was passionately fond of her and having determined to establish his pretensions he informed the king and queen that his principality was of an extent and beauty that merited particular attention the king told him that mouffette was at liberty to choose herself a husband and that he would contradict her in nothing that he must strive to please her as it was the only means of obtaining his wish the prince was in ecstasies at this answer he had learned at several meetings that he was not indifferent to her and having at last declared himself to her she told him that if he did not become her husband she would have no one else mufi transported with joy threw himself at her feet and conjured her in the most tender terms not to forget the declaration she had made he immediately hastened to the king and queen's apartment and gave them an account of the progress of his passion for mouffette and begged them not to defer his happiness they gave their consent with pleasure for prince mufi was so accomplished that he alone seemed worthy of possessing the admirable mouffette the king wished to betroth them before mufi returned to his kingdom where he had to go to give orders for his marriage for he would rather never have set out than go away without certain assurances that he should be made happy on his return the princess mouffette could not bid him adieu without shedding many tears she had undefinable sensations which afflicted her and the queen seeing the prince overwhelmed with grief gave him her daughter's portrait entreating him by the love he bore them both that the entry he was going to order should not be so magnificent as to retard in the least his return he said madame i never obeyed you with so much pleasure as i shall on this occasion my heart is too much interested in it to allow me to neglect the means of making myself happy he departed with expedition and the princess mouffette while awaiting his return occupied herself with music and the instrument she had learned to play only a few months back she performed on to admiration one day as she was in the queen's room the king entered his face covered with tears and taking his daughter's hand oh my child said he oh unfortunate father unlucky king that i am he could say no more sighs choked his utterance the queen and princess dreadfully frightened asked him what was the matter and after a while he told him that a monstrous giant had just arrived calling himself ambassador from the dragon of the lake who pursuant to the promise exacted by him from the king for aiding him to fight and conquer the monsters was come to demand the princess mouffette to the end of eating her in a pie that he was bound by a terrible oath to give him whatever he should ask for and in those days breaking one's word was unknown on hearing the sorrowful news the queen uttered dreadful cries folding the princess in her arms they shall rather take my life said she and persuade me to deliver my daughter to the monster let him take our kingdom and all that we possess unnatural father could you consent to such a shocking barbarity what make my child into a pie i cannot endure the thought send the cruel ambassador here perhaps my grief may soften him the king made no reply but went to speak to the giant 
and led him to the queen's presence she threw himself at his feet and with her daughter conjured him to have pity on them and persuade the dragon to take all they had but save muffet's life but he answered that that did not at all depend on him and that the dragon was too obstinate and too dainty that when he took it into his head to eat any delicate morsel the gods themselves could not remove his longing that he counselled them as a friend to do the thing with a good grace as otherwise the most dreadful misfortunes might follow at these words the queen fainted away and the princess would have done so likewise only her assistance was necessary to her mother the sorrowful news was no sooner spread in the palace than it became known to all the town nothing was heard but weeping and groans for muffet was adored the king could not decide to give her to the giant and the giant who had already been staying several days began to get tired and threatened in a dreadful manner however the king and queen said what, what worse can, can happen, happen to us when, when the, the dragon, dragon of the lake, of the lake comes, comes to devour, devour us we, we shall, shall be no longer afflicted but, but if, if our muffet is made into, into a pie, pie we, we shall be undone, undone. thereupon the giant informed them that he had received news from his master and that if the princess was willing to marry a certain nephew of his he consented to allow her to live for the rest that the nephew was a very handsome prince and that she might live very happily with him this proposal soothed a little their majesties grief the queen spoke to the princess but she found her still more averse to this marriage than to death i am incapable madame said muffet of preserving my life by an act of infidelity you promised me prince mufi and i will never marry any other let me die the close of my life will secure the peace of your own the king entered he said to his daughter all that the fondest tenderness could dictate she remained unchanged in her sentiments and finally it was resolved to conduct her to the summit of a high mountain whence the dragon of the lake was to come and fetch her everything was prepared for this sorrowful sacrifice the sacrifices of iphigenia and of psyche could not have been more mournful nothing was to be seen but black clothes and pale and doleful countenances four hundred young ladies of the highest quality dressed themselves in long white garments and put on cypress crowns to accompany her she was carried in a black velvet open sedan so that everybody might behold this masterpiece of beauty her hair was scattered over her shoulders and tied with crape and the crown on her head was of jasmine and marigold she only appeared moved by the grief of the king and queen who were following overwhelmed with the most profound grief the giant armed at all points marched by the side of the princess's sedan and looking at her with a greedy eye seemed as though he felt pretty certain of eating his share of her the air resounded with sighs and sobs the road was flooded with the tears that were shed ah frog frog cried the queen you have abandoned me alas why did you grant me your assistance in the gloomy plain if you refuse it at present happy should i have been had i died there i should not then have seen all my hopes deceived to-day i should not have seen my dear muffet on the point of being devoured while she was making these lamentations they still kept moving forward walking however very slowly and at last they arrived at the summit of that fatal mountain there they redoubled their cries and sorrow to such a degree that nothing ever was so mournful the giant requested everybody to bid the princess adieu and return they retired immediately for in those days people were very unsophisticated and always did what they could not help doing with a good grace the king and queen when they had reached some distance ascended another mountain with all their court that they might thence observe all that happened to the princess in effect they had not been there long before they saw a dragon nearly a mile and a half long in the air although he had six large wings his body was so heavy that he could hardly fly and it was covered with large blue scales and long fiery darts his tail being disposed in fifty folds and a half each of his claws was as large as a windmill and inside his open jaws was a triple row of teeth as large as those of an elephant but as he was gradually advancing the dear and faithful frog mounted on a sparrowhawk flew rapidly toward prince Mufi she wore her wreath of roses and though he was locked in his closet she entered it without a key 
What are you doing here, unfortunate lover? She said. You are dreaming of the charms of Mufet, who is at this moment exposed to the most terrible misfortune. Here, then, is a rose leaf. By blowing on it, I will transform it into an excellent horse, as you shall see. Immediately, a white horse made his appearance. She gave him a sword, six ells in length, and lighter than a feather. She clothed him in a single diamond, which fitted him like a suit of clothes, and although it was harder than a rock, it was so flexible that it did not the least constrain his motions in any respect. Depart, said Grenouillette to him. Run, fly to the defense of her whom you love. The horse which I give you will take you where she is. When you have effected her deliverance, inform her of the share I have had in it. Generous fairy, cried the prince, I cannot at present manifest my gratitude, but I declare that I will always be your very faithful slave. He mounted his horse, which immediately galloped off, and made better speed than three of the best hunters, so that he arrived in a very short time at the summit of the mountain, where he saw his dear princess by herself, and the frightful dragon slowly drawing near. He became furious, and attempted to spring upon the prince, but the six L's long sword was of so good a temper that he could handle it just as he liked, sometimes bearing it up to the hilt in the monster's body, and at others using it as a whip. The prince would not have failed to feel the strength of his claws, but for the diamond dress, which was impenetrable. Mufet had recognized him a long way off, for the diamond which covered him was very bright and clear, so that she was seized with the most mortal apprehension of which woman is susceptible. But the king and queen began to feel in their heart a few rays of hope, for it was very extraordinary to see a horse and a prince in a diamond case, armed with a formidable sword, arrive at so opportune a moment and fight with so much bravery. The king put his hat on his walking-stick, and the queen fastened her handkerchief to the end of a piece of wood, to make signs to the prince and encourage him. All their cortege did the same. But in fact it was unnecessary. His courage alone and the peril to which he saw his mistress exposed was sufficient to excite him. What mighty efforts he made! The earth was strewed with darts, claws, horns, wings and scales of the dragon. His blood flowed from a thousand wounds. It was quite blue, and the horse's was quite green, which made a singular combination of colors on the ground. The prince fell five times, always rising again himself. He watched his opportunity to remount his horse, and then such fighting ensued that nothing was ever like it felt. At last the dragon's strength was exhausted. He fell, and the prince dealt him a wound which left a fearful gash and what is almost incredible but is nevertheless as true as the rest of the tale is that the most beautiful and charming prince that was ever seen issued forth from that large wound his coat was of blue velvet with a gold ground embroidered all over with pearls on his head he wore a little greek morion shaded with white feathers he ran with open arms and embracing prince mufi what do i not owe you my generous liberator said he to him you who have just delivered me from the most frightful prison that ever monarch was confined in i was condemned to that punishment by the fairy lioness sixteen years i have languished there and her power was such that in spite of my own will she would have forced me to devour this adorable princess conduct me to her feet that i may explain my misfortune prince mufi surprised and delighted with so astounding an adventure was in no respect behind this prince in complaisance they hastened to join the beautiful mufette who for her part thanked the gods a thousand times for so unexpected a happiness the king queen and all the court were already near her they were all speaking at once not one of them being able to distinguish what the others said there were almost as many tears shed for joy as there had been recently shed for grief at last that nothing might be wanting to the happiness of all present the good frog appeared in the air mounted on a sparrow-hawk which had little golden bells attached to its feet when they heard the tinkle tinkle they all looked up they saw her wreath of roses shine like a little sun the frog herself being as beautiful as aurora the queen advanced toward her and took one of her little paws then the wise frog metamorphosed herself and appeared like a noble queen her face was the most agreeable in the world. I come, cried she, to crown the fidelity of the Princess Mufet. She preferred exposing her life to changing her sentiments. This example is rare in the present period. 
but it will be much more so in the ages to come she then took two myrtle crowns and with them crowned the happy pair who loved each other so tenderly and making three strokes with their wand all the bones of the dragon rose and formed a triumphal arc in commemoration of the important event which had just taken place then that fair and numerous troop journeyed toward the sea singing wedding songs with as much gaiety as they had sorrowfully mourned the sacrifice of the princess the wedding was only deferred until the next day it may be easily imagined with what joy it was celebrated end of chapter 12 the beneficent frog recorded by cheryl holmes md